So here we go. Boiling point elevation, freezing point depression. So my mom is curious about everything. So one of these days, if she shows up in lecture, you'd be like, oh, she just showed up in lecture. <laughs> so anyway, we were talking about this at dinner last night. Um, this whole idea of freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. Um, so, Raoult's Law, you guys buy that? Yes. Okay, what does the not with the solvent mean? The pure. Pure yeah. stuff, very good, that's the pure stuff. Now, is the, um, the equilibrium vapor pressure, is it going to be higher or lower for a mixture for a, that has a solute added to it? Lower. It's going to be lower, exactly, equilibrium vapor pressure lowering. You got it. Um, so, of course, X stands for what? Mole fraction. Mole fraction, yep. So, if you only have two things, you have the solvent and you have a non-volatile solute, the mole fraction of them should add up to equal to one. So, we're going to do a little bit of substitution in here. We can rearrange that. So, the mole fraction of the solvent is one minus the mole fraction of the solute, and we're going to substitute that back up in there for Raoul, in Raoul's Law, and it looks like this. I keep thinking that... She might come in, but... So substitution looks like this, okay? The equilibrium vapor pressure of the solvent in, um, in the solution is equal to 1 minus mole fraction of the solute. Too many S's in solutions, okay? Solute, okay, times the pure um, equilibrium vapor pressure of the solvent. And then hopefully you guys know that we need to distribute this through this difference, right? Okay, and that's what we're going to do on the next slide. Okay, if we distribute that through that quantity, we have this. Now, um, delta P, the change in the equilibrium vapor pressure, it's always final minus initial, so it's the P minus the P naught. You guys buy that? Okay, so we're going to kind of rearrange it, so we get P minus P naught. So this actually is delta P. Delta P then, and actually this has got a blue box around it. So this is just another form of Raoult's Law. You have to look at it closely because sometimes it looks like the original form. Okay, or I guess it doesn't look like the original form. But make sure you read your subscripts carefully. The blue box equations, by the way, does this make sense? Those are the ones you're going to see on your test. Okay, so this actually will most likely be there on your test. You'll get like in a separate equation sheet, and I think that's kind of the rule of thumb for your for your Gen Chem two unit exams. You get an equation sheet. So a bunch of equations. <laughs> the equilibrium vapor pressure lowering, okay, is equal to negative mole fraction of the solute, that non-volatile solute, times the equilibrium vapor pressure of the pure stuff at that temperature. Solvent. So you recognize this, okay? The pink and the blue, the pink, excuse me, the blue is the pure stuff, and the pink is the, the solvent to which a non-volatile solute has been added. Um, and then we talked about, okay, now, I'm building up for, and this is something, I don't memorize a lot of things, but I just kind of let it roll off the tip of my tongue. So it's, it's um, boiling point elevation freezing point depression. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. Boiling point elevation. So up here, this is the pure stuff. This is the impure stuff. Boiling point elevation, right? All right. This is the pure stuff. This is the stuff that to which a non-volatile solute has been added. Freezing point depression. That's it. So the next few slides, we're going to kind of walk through some problems, and actually you're going to look at this phenomenon in, in lab tomorrow. You're going to look at freezing point depression. Okay? So, but there it is on your pressure temperature phase diagrams. All right. So there's Raoult's Law, that other form of Raoult's Law. And I'm not going to talk you through how this works, but just a minute ago, do you remember on the curves... Temperature. Oh, I might totally watch this. Okay. 
phase diagram of the pure stuff, phase diagram of the impure stuff. Well, not bad. Okay, so this is pure on the inside, and this is impure. This is the solution here. I'm going to make this um, one atmosphere. Why is it? What's the significance of one atmosphere? The normal boiling point. That's the normal, exactly, to get the normal yeah. boiling point temperature. So this would be, of course, we have solids. Um, oops. Final answer solids, liquids, and gases here. So these transition temperatures are our freezing point and melting point, and these are our boiling points and condensation points. Okay. So, um, boiling point is it elevation or depression? Elevation. Elevation. Boiling point elevation right here. Okay. So actually that delta T BP is right here. Work for you? Okay. Um, freezing point depression. We'll go ahead and do that one too. Oh, before I do that one. Okay, so K, big K, right? Okay, K is actually going to have to be, not always be given to you, but it's a constant associated with the solvent, okay? Not the solute. But what's the little M stand for? Molality. So you're going to take that constant that's given to you times the molality of the solute. Not, okay? So what is molality? What units are molality? Molality of solute. What goes in the top? Moles of solute. Yep. What goes in the bottom? Yes, one kilogram solvent. Too many S's in solutions. Oh, my day. So we're going to work some problems here in a minute, and we're going to come up with the boiling point elevation. Or we're going to work with the boiling point elevation. Okay. The boiling point elevation is the KBP associated with the solvent times the molality of the solute. Um, the delta T's, whether it's a uh, boiling point elevation or freezing point depression, it's always final minus initial. What does this not here mean? Pure, exactly. So this would be the temperature in this case that it would boil at if it was pure. This is the temperature it boils at when it's got a non-volatile solute added to it, exactly. So what we're going to see, what does this greater than mean? Is it going to be positive or negative? Positive. Our boiling point elevations will always be positive. Makes sense because it's going to be the higher number minus the lower. All right. Freezing point depressions. Okay, this is the uh, freezing point. It, it, this is the temperature it freezes at if it's pure. This is the temperature it freezes at if it's got a non-volatile solute added to it. So freezing point depression. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, so down here, this is your delta T FP. Um, all right. So again, there's going to be a constant associated with, is it associated with the solvent or the solute? KFP, the solvent. Yes, not the solute. The solute enters in with regard to the molality. Now notice I have a negative sign. I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. But I have a negative sign associated with that. Do you buy this, that um, the freezing point depression, so actually T sub this one, without the knot, is going to be lower than it was in its pure state. We're going to talk about why that phenomenon is. Freezing point depression, love it, especially this time of year. Okay, so those are constants. They're associated with the solvent. Okay. The solute enters in when it comes time for the for the, the both of those boiling point elevation equation, freezing point depression equation. The solute enters in with regard to its molality. What's a colligative property? What if depending you pretending you're seeing on a test, what would you say colligative property is? It doesn't depend on the nature does not depend on the nature. And when you look at the boiling point elevation, the freezing point depression, delta T, BP is equal to 
equal to KVP times the molality of the solute. And I'll give these to you, although you probably don't need them on the test. Do you see where we have a colligative property going on here? I don't care what it is, it's just the molality. <laughs> What's so funny about that? It's a colligative property? <laughs> okay, very good. Sometimes the font's different. I can see that in this different font, I must have added this at the very end there. It's a colligative property. But this also means that, does this, this make sense? This is why we talked about solution concentration, because we have to talk about molality, because you have to be able to calculate molality. Okay. It's also good to be able to kind of go back and forth between density, weight percent, molality, molarity. It's a good thing. Okay. So here are some substances. These are five substances. This is the, this would be the what, the TFP naught. Do you buy that? That's what this column is. Okay, freezing point temperatures. This is the KFP freezing point constants. I know it says KF, but I think it should be KFP. Then for each substance, there is the T naught BP, normal boiling point temperature, and there is your KBPs. Now I'm going to kind of, we're going to do a problem here coming up where, I think this is right, it's possible that you can actually calculate these constants just simply by, let's say that you know the delta TBP and you know the molality of the solute. Can you get to the boiling point elevation constant? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So it's all about units, right? So here are all possible units for the um, boiling point elevation and freezing point depression constants, okay? They could be degrees Celsius per molal, degrees Celsius per molal. Of course, we've already kind of talked about this in this class, that if you see something that raised to the negative power, what does that mean? It's on the bottom, exactly. So here it's raised to the negative power. Okay, what about this? Do you guys buy this? That? Why can we do that? Degrees Celsius times kilogram of solvent over mole of solute. Exactly. This right, he this right here is basically unpacking molal. And molal, like we have over there, <coughs> is mole of solute in the numerator over kilogram of solvent in the denominator. But since it's in the denominator, you flip it. So that all works. OK. So what's up with the whole sign thing? Oops, my bad. I forgot the sign. Okay. What I tend to do and what your textbook tends to do is to go ahead and associate a negative sign with your, um, yeah, putting a negative sign with your constant. Or, sorry, darn it. No, not a negative sign. Putting a negative sign with your equation. Okay. And then your freezing point constants are positive. If you do that, then actually it's going to work out fine because your delta T's uh, for freezing point, we said this is always going to be negative. So this is going to be less than zero. And this one is greater than zero. So then you'll have a negative one of this, a negative associated with the sign, and what should be the sign of molality? Positive. <laughs> And that's what you need or you want. Some textbooks, though, go ahead and they take out this negative associated with the equation and they instead associate it with the constant. And then your delta t's are, are negative and your constant's negative. So then it works out that way. I'm just warning you. You're like, can't you just get together and do it one way? I guess not. All right. So there we go. Our boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, that's the delta TBP, delta TFP. Um.
Okay. So here's where I'm going to kind of show you um, why is the freezing point temperature depressed if you have a non-volatile solute. So again, I said this is kind of um, appropriate for right now because we might put salt on the roads. And we're, this is what we were talking about at dinner time last night. Salt on the roads to go ahead and instead of freezing at um, zero Celsius, it's going to freeze at a lower temperature. So you have a fighting chance of your roads not freezing. Okay. Why is that? And um, I have a, do I have a video that's coming up? No, I have a still image that's coming up. This isn't my favorite still image. Sometimes I look at this, I'm like, what is this telling me? So all this is trying to tell you, you see these, um, well, one of the things, in organic chemistry, if you're trying to um, synthesize something and go ahead and bring that something out of solution, the, the more beautiful the crystals, okay, the more pure it is. Okay, so down here we kind of have nice, pure, pink thing that we're trying to recover. See that blobby thing up there? Okay, that's actually a mixture. Okay, so what they're saying basically is this whole, this whole test tube is at the same temperature. They're saying down here in its pure state, it's solidified. Up there in its mixture state, it's still a blobby liquid solution. That's all they're saying. So up here, and that's kind of what the caption says. Up here we have a mixture, it's still a liquid. And down here we have it in its pure state, and we have it in its solid state. Okay. So this is to say at the same temperature, it's staying a liquid, okay, when it's mixed with a non-volatile solute. Now, this is actually my favorite way of, of looking at it. Well, it's coming up. So this is just kind of talking you through. Now, the fact that all the little balls are the same color means this is the, this is the, uh, <laughs> this is the stuff in its pure state, okay? Now, what is the kind of, what are the up arrows? Equilibrium. It's an equilibrium. The up arrows are dissolving. The down arrows are, are solidifying or, or precipitating, crystallizing, going from a liquid to a solid. So here we have, and actually, if you have a solution that has a sludge of, of salt on the bottom, okay, that means that you basically have your salt is going from its solid to its liquid and from its liquid back to its solid again. Okay, it's in dynamic equilibrium. Now, the difference here is we've introduced a non-volatile non -volatile, um, solute. So this actually then can run interference. So notice it took a little bit of time, like between the second and the third beaker, but a new equilibrium is established, okay? And you end up with actually it's less likely to solidify. It's, and it kind of runs the interference thing. So this over here at the far left, excuse me, far right, okay, this is less likely to solidify because these foreign particles are kind of running interference for it to crystallize. So that's kind of how that goes. I think it's kind of similar to the, in its liquid state trying to evaporate, it runs interference for it there too, I think. Okay, so let's get on to some problems. We're going to deal with benzene, so we're going to pick up, we're going to see that table here in a minute. We're going to pick up all the information we need to know about, about benzene. So we're supposed to come up with what temperature would benzene freeze at if it boils at this temperature. You're like, are you serious? So actually, this is an example where we're going to pick on benzene. We're going to look at its boiling point elevation. Okay, and we're going to come up with a molality based upon that. Okay, and then we're going to apply that molality to look at its freezing point depression. And I know it sounds silly, but that's exactly what we're going to do. So these are all things that would be given to you. Sometimes students are like, well, what would you give me in this sort of problem? I would give you all of this stuff. You need to know what it should boil at. Notice you see the boiling point elevation there, right? Instead of 80.1, it's 82.0. Okay, and we don't know what the freezing point depression is. We know it should freeze at 5.5 degrees Celsius, but it's going to freeze cooler than that. We have the constants given both for boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. So like I said, the strategy is going to be first to use that boiling point elevation to knock out the molality of the solute. And then we're going to use the molality in our freezing point depression equation to find the, the delta TFP. And then last but not least, we have to apply that delta TFP 
um, to come up with what the, that depressed temperature will be. So picking on benzene, these are the constants that you saw on the previous slide. Every once in a while they don't match up, but I think they match up here, okay? So those are the constants we're going to be using. Okay, so starting with the boiling point elevation phenomenon, okay, again, you'll be given this equation, but you need to know how to use it, okay? So um, we need to knock out delta T. So this is a situation where uh, we can come up with delta T. We're given K, B, P. We need to then knock out um, the molality. So it's always final minus initial, so it's the impure minus the pure. So our uh, delta T BPs will always be positive. So it's 82.0 minus 80.1. So we round according to decimals, and that gives us 1.9 degrees Celsius. You could do this a couple different ways. I think I'm going to rearrange the uh, boiling point elevation equation to solve for molality. So the molality of the solute is equal to delta TBP we just got divided by KBP, which we get from a table. Don't forget to always show your work and include units. So we can knock out the molality of this colligative property of a solute. Um, by taking the delta B, delta T BP, that 1.9 degrees Celsius, that boiling point elevation, divided by the, the K BP, which is 2.53. Don't forget that our K BPs and our K FPs will have units of degrees Celsius per molal. So in this case, our degrees Celsius cancel. We have basically the only units we have left is the inverse of molal in the denominator which makes it units of molal. Round according to two sig figs, I get 0.75 molal. So now we're ready to piggyback on that answer and now apply it to the phenomenon of freezing point depression. So it looks like this. We pick up the other equation, which delta TFP is equal to negative KFP times the molality of the solute. Um, we're ready just to plug in our KFP and the molality of the solute we got from before. So it looks like this. Delta TFP is equal to negative 5.12 uh, units of the, both of the depression constants are degrees Celsius per molal times the molality of the solute that we got from the boiling point elevation, 0.75 molal. And this sometimes students will ask me, and I don't know, I don't have the answer, although if you wanted to, you could actually put just a little m. Okay, I'd be fine with that. I think probably one of the reasons I steered away from it on my, when I'm trying to teach it, is because that little m is so easy to confuse with a big M. And uh, that's not how this property relates, it's molality. Okay, so molals cancel. We're left with degrees Celsius, which is perfect. Round to two sig figs, I got a negative 3.8 degrees Celsius. So our delta T FPs should always be negative. So now if you're like me, you think you're out of the woods, and you kind of are, but it's really easy to mess this up, okay, because what we're after is what is the reduced temperature that it will freeze at. So what I would do is to go ahead, in order to apply this, I would rewrite what delta T means. It's the final minus initial. It's the reduced stuff, which is what we're after, the temperature at which it freezes, minus the temperature it freezes at if it was pure. We have that. So rearranging, solving for the T, T is equal to, dun, 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 delta T plus T naught. Remember, we're carrying a negative sign with our delta Ts. So this is all to say that we're going to take our delta T, negative 3.8, plus um, the temperature it freezes at if it's pure, 5.5, parentheses, degrees Celsius. Since we're adding, we can go ahead and put that in parentheses, have the same units outside. We round according to decimals. 
and we get the depressed, depressed freezing point temperature of a whopping 1.7 degrees Celsius. So last night, we were trying to kind of convince mom of this or whatever, and so last night what, what my husband did was he took a, uh, a cup of ice water, okay, a cup of ice water, and if you stick a thermometer in a cup of ice water, what happens is your ice is, um, your ice probably in your freezer is running maybe, uh, we usually use 30, we usually use the Fahrenheit scale for mom, so it's probably running about zero Fahrenheit, okay, so your ice is zero Fahrenheit. What temperature does it melt at? In Fahrenheit scale, it's 32. 32. So what happens is your ice, which is zero Fahrenheit, hits the water, and it basically will uh, start to uh, melt, okay? And it will go ahead and it will cool your water down to the transition temperature, which is 32. So it'll be kind of somewhat in equilibrium between solid and liquid state, okay? So you have ice, which is zero, and water, which was, I don't know, um, you know, maybe 40 degrees Fahrenheit, kind of cooling down to a 32. So then he added salt into it, okay, which would make the water freeze and melt at a lower temperature. And my goodness, that thing went from 32 down to like 20, 20 Fahrenheit. So it depressed the transition temperature, which then went ahead and made kind of the solution in equilibrium go down to that lower temperature. And then we were talking to mom about if you've ever made homemade ice cream, of course, that's what you do, right? Around the outside, you go ahead and use kind of a slurry of, of ice and water and salt. So that is so cool. And I'm hoping to remember because um, I told uh, Paul when I do this. So if I remember to bring it, it's a little messy on Friday. I want to bring everybody um, so you can make your own little slushies. So it goes like this. It is so cool. You need two sizes of Ziploc bags. You need ice. You need salt. And Carl's like, you should get some salt. Some salt. And then in the inside Ziploc bag, you put juice. So um, I'll just probably bring grape juice. I don't know if anybody. And I'll bring cups. What's that? For the lab, we should make ice cream. It's, well, it's not a lab, but that this, this, what will happen with the juice is it will, what will happen to the juice is it will turn into a slurry. I just think. Makes sense. Yeah. Anyway, that's as far as I, close as I'm getting to ice cream. For lab credit, we're going to make ice cream today. <laughs> some, some labs out there, like, make pies and everything. I don't know. I, I mean... <laughs> yeah. There's a really cool uh, ice cream shop that makes ice cream with um, liquid nitrogen, I think. It's nuts. It's really uh, cool. Yeah. I like how they do it. They make too. And a lot of times, I don't have time to do all that fun stuff because I'm, I'm too busy torturing you with the basics of general chemistry. But so you took the basics and applied it to that. Well, I still wouldn't have time. No, no. I'd have to pull something in, so. Um... Okay, so I put exam on this problem because usually, your, of course, your unit one exam is not made yes. up yet. Yes, it's next Thursday, right? Yes, a week yes. from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. oh. um, but a lot of times, this is a, the, a kind of problem I have on the test. So the way this problem goes, and I think I'll make a little picture of it, because if I was working this problem, I would make a little picture is basically you observe a, in this case, a freezing point depression. And from that freezing point depression, we get to the molality of the solute. And from molality of the solute, we can get to the molar mass of the solute with the information that's given. So um, I kind of told you the other day, I encourage you, and some of you guys are doing this, to go come up with abbreviations. Okay? So laurel alcohol... We'll put LA for lauryl alcohol, and actually tomorrow's lab you're using, I think it's lauric alcohol, or lauric alcohol, so, and benzene, you know, we'll just put B for benzene, and we go ahead and prop, the problem with these problems is you're not familiar, you don't do a lot with lauryl alcohol, nor do you do much with benzene probably yet, so you have to kind of focus on what's what. 
So it looks like we've got the lauryl alcohol, it actually is the non-volatile solute as it turns out. So we have 5.00 grams of LA and we're going to add it to a tenth of a kilogram of benzene. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put solvent down here. I could put solute up here. Now, you know, you wouldn't have to do that. But that's kind of the situation we have going on here. It goes ahead and it says us that this particular solution freezes at a depressed temperature of 4.1 degrees Celsius. So that's my T, isn't it? TFP, without the knot, is 4.1 degrees Celsius. So question mark, what is the molality? Little m. And sometimes in the margins, I'll go ahead and unpack that. What that means, you guys told me, is going to be moles of solute. I'm going to put mole of LA. This is where this might kind of be helpful. Mole of LA per kilogram of B. Do you buy that? So that's what I'm after. Can't see it. <laughs> Okay, can tilt that down, but it's got my, uh, by the way, I did not charge up my laptop last night, but I think we'll be okay. <laughs> okay, so this is what we're after. I'm going to show you how to work this sort of problem. Um, and I think I have it kind of outlined here. Uh, bottom line is we can come up, we can compare our T to our T naught to come up with delta TFP. We can use the freezing point depression um, equation to come up with the molality of our LA, okay? And then I'm going to kind of show you that our last step, once we have the molality of the lauryl, lauryl, lauryl alcohol, um, then we can go ahead and use the information that's given to get to, um, oh, that's not what we're after. My bad. Okay, molality is that. That's not the question. The question is, what's the molar mass? Okay, what's the units for molar mass? Run out of room. No, that's the AA, uh, AMUs is the units are the units for uh, mass. This is molar mass. So <laughs> grams per mole, exactly. So this is what we're after. We're after grams of lauryl alcohol, lauryl, you know what I mean, LA per one mole of LA. That's what we're after. Final answer. Actually, this we can get from this. So. so this is just kind of showing you, since we're worried about benzene, okay, we'll find the line for benzene and use all that we need to know about freezing point constant or freezing point, uh, the normal freezing point temperature from benzene. So we pick this off of the table. Benzene, 5.53 and 5.1. Two degrees Celsius per mile. I have a real quick question. Uh huh. When we get the exam, are we going to be able to get a table like this that will have like the constant, or should when we you start get, memorizing no, these? No, you don't need to memorize <laughs> these. You'll either have a table, or I'll give it to you, kind okay. of embedded in the question. Okay. Yeah. No, that doesn't seem like something I'd have you. <laughs> I usually draw arrows next to the constants you need yeah. to memorize. Um, okay, so we're going to use that freezing point depression to come up with molality. Okay, and then we're going to use molality to knock out, ultimately, I changed what we're after. Once we have molality, we're going to come up with this ratio for a little acid alcohol. Okay, and there's a couple ways kind of to get to that last step, but I'll show you how my notes do it. So what is the freezing point depression? It's T minus T naught, which is that 4.1 minus 5.53 degrees Celsius. Uh, I need to round to the nearest tenth. Okay, so our delta TFP is negative 1.4 degrees Celsius. Should be negative, right? Then we're going to rearrange our, um, our freezing point depression equation, solving for molality. So the molality of the solute is equal to delta TFP, which we just got, divided by negative KFP for benzene which I give that to you. If I don't give that to you, I guess I've already said a little bit. Um, 
Back to your question, Cameron. If I don't give it to you, you have enough information to find it yourself. Okay. So I reserve that right. Okay. All right, so substituting in, we come up with the molality of the solute is uh, equal to negative 1.4 degrees Celsius divided by the KFP, negative 5.12 degrees Celsius per molal. The degree, degree Celsius cancel. The inverse of molal in the denominator is the molal. So rounded to two sig figs, I get 0.27 molal. And I'm going to go ahead and on my thing over here, I'm going to unpack that just so, and I think I do in my notes too. I'm running out of room here. Make a little spot up here. I'm going to unpack what that 0.27 molal means. What it means is there's 0.27 moles of LA in one kilogram of B, benzene. Okay. So I'm going to, and I should have another color. I do have another color. I'm going to emphasize the uh, information that was originally given. I'm going to revisit this right here that I said I basically dosed 0 0.100 grams of benzene with five grams, <coughs> bless you, of my laurel alcohol. I'm going to use that to my advantage. Okay. So yeah, here's where I kind of unpacked what that molal means. And this is the point where a few slides ago I said working this using kind of, I like to call it dimensional analysis, what the units are, what the dimensions are, kind of using that to your advantage to find your way through the problem. Because on the next step, I'm going to say this. We didn't have one kilogram of benzene but we had 0 0.100 kilograms of benzene. Do you see how I can use this molality and the mass of benzene I had to come up with moles of LA? That's exactly what I'm going to do here. Moles of LA was the mass of benzene I have, 0 0.100 kilograms. Now I need to convert that to um, no, I don't need to convert it to kilograms. I need to convert that to kilograms. It's in kilograms. <laughs> okay. But do you see where if I take the mass of benzene, which I had, 0.100 kilograms, once I have molality, is that's my first term, and then use the molality as 0.27 mole LA over 1 kilogram of B. My Bs cancel. My kilograms of B more specifically cancel. I have 0 0.027 moles of LA. 0 0.027 moles of Li. You see where these abbreviations are nice? You're like, but somewhere you have to say what it is. So we're almost done. We said that the molar mass is a ratio of grams to moles of the substance. And do you see on my original information that I was given grams of Li? Now I have moles of Li. All I have to do is take a ratio. Moles divided by grams, and then you're done. So, sorry, moles divided by grams, darn it, grams divided by moles, and you're done, final answer. So we dosed it with 5.00 grams of lauryl alcohol. We found out that the moles um, is 0 0.027 LA. So 5.00 LA divided by 0.027 LA. Round to two significant figures, that should give me grams per mole. And that's the molar mass of moral alcohol. As determined by, I just think this is so cool, as, as determined by its observed freezing point of pressure. I don't know what the is. Sounds like something's taken off out there. So, would this most likely be kilograms of benzene we start with? Could be. Do you have to change it from grams of the solvent yeah. to kilograms and then go ahead and use your yeah, molality? It's possible. I don't know. But, and you know, there might not be one of those on the test, but I'm trying to think, you know, I, um, years, years ago, um, no, I, that isn't right. I was going to say I took a test at UNI as a, just a high school student to try to get a scholarship in chemistry. 
and I ended up um, being runner-up to getting that scholarship, and then the guy withdrew, so I ended up getting a full ride to U and I, just on chemistry. And anyway, which I had no idea that that would happen. So when you take a test like that, sometimes they throw kind of, I don't think they throw. Can you still exist? What's that? Can you still do that stuff? I don't know. That was years and years ago. <laughs> but you can get academic scholarships, but I don't know. Not that juicy anymore. Because along those lines, my husband and I used to be able to work in the summers and make enough money to go to a university. Can't do that anymore. Okay. All right. So are we on assignment slide? Yes. Okay. My goodness, my thing's not working. So these will be due. Oh, no. Yeah, we are on assignment slide. These will be due on Friday. And we're going to go ahead and we'll, we'll hold that other. Now, an important change. You guys see draw a line through 1370. Take a quick look. We have time. I didn't look at these ahead of time, so that's kind of dangerous. But 1369. It's outside. Okay. Um, oh, molar mass problem. So this one's just kind of like what we just did. So it's good. And we wrote exam on it. So uh, my hints go something like this. Um, again, we're. Sometimes you can use the boiling point elevation to get the molality to ultimately get the grams per mole of the sol solute too. Okay, so this is very similar to what we did in, in class. Okay, the next one looks like this. Oh, oh, skip it. Remember 69, you have the answers under Doc Sharon too, right? Which could be good or bad. Sometimes if you don't get the right answer, like, drat. Okay. No. <laughs> Do the extra credit I gave you, dude. I'm not listening to you for extra credit anymore. I'm just trying to help everybody else out. Right. Okay. So C6H6 is benzene. C6H12 is cyclohexane. So here we have cyclohexane. So it's like snowflake. Yeah. And the one thing I told my chemistry students this morning when I couldn't draw a benzene ring was, don't you think this would make a great wreath? But, you know, I did go out and try to find benzene ring wreaths. I couldn't find them. Anyway, okay, so, again, do you see how I put red up there? Like, what's the solvent? What's the solute? I think you've got to clearly hit that, hit you over the head with that. Okay. Um, let's see, what is this problem? What is KF or KFP for cyclohexane? Okay. Notice in this case they aren't giving it to you. You have to find it. If you have to find it, I bet that um, you know the, the freezing point depression, and I bet you know the molality, okay? And you do. So that's how that goes. You could actually kind of look it up, too. Google it, okay? Um, the next thing says, which would make a better, um, which would make a better solvent, solute solvent, okay, for molar mass determination by freezing point depression? Benzene or cyclohexane? And I wrote the highest, um, the one that has, observes the highest change in freezing point, so that has the highest KFP per molal sol solvent, solute, excuse me. All right, uh, this one. We're dealing with water. Hey, how hard could it be? So water's our solvent. Um, they give the boiling point temperature at a particular uh, pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury is atmospheric usually, so we must have climbed a mountain, have a little bit of reduced atmospheric pressure. Say it boils at a lower temperature instead of 100, it's 99.6. And then it says at that same elevation, oh, this is a good one. At that same elevation, what needs to be the molality of the solute in order to jack up the boiling point temperature so now it's at 100? This is that why when you climb a mountain, in order for water to boil at normal boiling point temperatures we're used to 100, you have to add salt to it, boiling point elevation. Okay. So what are my hints here? So you can come up with a delta T BP. Okay. Um, 
you can get the uh, boiling point constant from a table, and you can knock out the molality of the solute. So that's not so bad. Then you're, once you have that, you somehow need to convert that molality to mass percent. And that's kind of what you guys did earlier. Remember we kind of did solution concentration and kind of going back and forth between different ways of expressing solution concentration. So you're going to take the molality and backtrack it to um, weight percent. And I said my starting point, since you're dealing with molality, I would go with one kilogram of solvent. That's what I would do. Okay. So that's it. That's for all regular credit. <laughs> okay? So we'll see you hopefully for slushies on no ice cream. <laughs>